Welcome, Blogging Heads Nation. This is a uh, long-delayed uh, ed edition of Dresbert. Uh, I'm Daniel Dresner. I'm a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and I write the Spoiler Alerts column for the Washington Post. And I'm Heather Hurlbert, giving you the chance to say Happy New Year one more time. Um, I sit at New America and write for New York Magazine, and um, welcome to 2018. Um, I can't believe it's still only January. Dan, I feel like we've lived through at least half another year already. Well, this this is a good time to mention that, in fact, we've just finished the entire first year of Donald Trump's presidency, and it just sailed by in the sense that, um, you know, surgery without anesthesia sails by. Um, so it, it, we're in a sort of interesting juncture because we can look back on, on Trump's first year. And of course, as we speak, uh, Trump is hobnobbing in Davos uh, with all various kinds of global elites. Um, you just came back, I believe, from a... a uh, not Davos, obviously, but uh, a uh, what's the name of it? Rezana or I was at Rezana, which is the uh, Rezana. the Indian the Indian government's answer to Davos. Excellent. You okay, know. you can't you can't be a rising power if you don't have a Davos these days. That's very. Have you ever been to Davos, by the way? Uh, I have. I went with President Clinton in two thousand. Oh, so uh, you were part of the so which was, I mean, he was the last president to go to Davos. Okay. Yes, I, I reminisced about this a bit in New York Magazine earlier this week. That um, you know when I went. Uh, with a president who was both beset by personal scandal and policy troubles over trade and globalization. Um, and I should say a staff that spent a considerable amount of time screaming at each other over the content of the speech that, that uh, <laughs> he gave there. Little, little did I ever imagine that, you know, sort of, um, it would replay itself as, as a, uh, I don't know. Farce is farce, quite the right word, say. but yeah. yeah. But you would that would be looked at as the golden age of of you know presidential appearances at Davos, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I will I will now confess for our blogging heads audience that actually that was that was I think that was the the nadir of my um, my presidential speech writing period. It was it was the one and only speech that I was reduced to tears over. Oh wow. Um, um, and in retrospect, of course, it wasn't about me. It was about how hard the issue was and how um, how visceral the the disagreements inside the White House on how to how to deal with sort of the problems and blowback of globalization, which I mean, looks really it looks really sort of mild and like nothing um, from from this vantage point. Uh, I was going to say, speaking of visceral divisions within the White House, uh, <laughs> so. You know, let's uh, take a, a, a sort of step back and think about Trump's first year, at least with respect to, to foreign policy. Um, and, you know, there were a variety of uh, uh, exercises taken along these lines, some of whom I think um, David Gordon and um, Michael O'Hanlon sort of said, oh, you know, better than we expected. And Richard Haas uh basically indicating that he's like reaching for the whiskey bottle um, in terms of his uh, his reaction. Uh, let's hear your reaction. Um, you know, the piece I saw that I appreciated the most actually was um, Stuart Patrick, who mm -hmm. took advantage of the one year anniversary to to start doing something that that I think, frankly, people need to need to do more of, which is rounding up ways that other governments are starting to hedge or change in in response to what to what they're getting from here so that you know in some ways i think the the david gordon michael hanlon it's just it's asking the wrong question um because you know yes we didn't we didn't get into a nuclear exchange the first year so hooray yes um, you know which I, I some people were expecting that but yeah go ahead but we know i mean this is it's this is, foreign policy is about long term it's about planning it's about seed corn it's about investment mm -hmm. and in all of those areas we are um laying down um rhetoric is one word um, well, we're basically gonna... not investing in anything. I mean, I think that's the way. Oh, I disagree. I think oh, really? We are, we are investing. We are investing really hard in a world in which um, ethno-nationalism is not just tolerated but prized. Mm. We are investing really hard in a world in which um, everybody should hedge their bets um, as opposed to everybody assuming that alliances and agreements will hold. We are, we are investing in 
in a more zero sum every actor for for itself world and you know no you can't wreck nato in a year mm-hmm. but you can um you can lay down some blows to the foundation that will that will take years to to play themselves out so wait i i under, i I understand you're sort of being snarky about this, but I want to push back a little bit in the following sense, which is... Oh, good. Dan's going to be an optimist. Dan's going to be an optimist. (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. I'm actually... No, no, no. (laughs) If you can believe it, I'm going to be far more of a pessimist than you are, which is to say, I think rhetorically what you're saying is is correct. I mean, you know, and this goes back to the McMaster Cohn op-ed through most of Trump's rhetoric, obviously through the policy actions, whether we're talking about withdrawal from TPP or Paris or the disparagement of of, uh, burden sharing within NATO and so on and so forth. The part I would push back on is the notion that we've invested anything into this alternative order. There's been a lot of rhetorical, you know, faints in that direction. But but I would say two things. First, if you actually look at, for example, the strategy documents, whether it's the national security strategy or the national defense strategy, there's a recognition that great power competition is a new thing. But nothing along the lines that, that you're talking about with respect to um you know, the liberal international order as we know it no longer exists. We need to prepare for for something new. Instead, you've got those documents, which admittedly there's a fair amount of cognitive dissonance with them. But both those documents imply, look, we need to shore up the liberal international order that our president is tearing down. You, he doesn't say that doesn't say that second part. But I, I don't think there's any I mean, I think there's a uh, there's a belief in terms of how the, the, the world looks. I don't know if there is any agreement about um, uh, I'm sorry, Heather, can you hold on one second? I'm smelling something that smells like burning and I need to go check on it. So, uh, you can answer very it's the quickly. Liberal, it's the liberal world order. It's the liberal world order. Hold on. I'll be right back. But actually yeah. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to push back and okay, go ahead, good. I'm going to suggest that um, you've forgotten the cardinal rule of movie making and international politics, which is follow the money. Um, Okay. So if you if you think about some of the uh, things that we've done at the UN, I mean, most recently defunding UNRWA, um, aid to the Palestinians, yeah. and looking for so other places, you know, in the context of the UN where we have um, disinvested, as you will, in, in parts of the parts of the liberal international order. Um, I think my my recently having been in in India is very influential in my thinking here because the Indians feel that they're being invested in. Hmm. Um, okay. And the That's Indians, good the Indians feel that they're being invested in. They, um, you know, I don't think anyone there thinks that that um, Trump is a marvelous, um, a marvelous personality or a towering, um, a towering intellect or or a tower, towering um, character. But but they're feeling um, taken they, care of, is what you're but saying. But they're feeling taken care of, and they're feeling. Um, a U.S. approach to the world shift to one that's more congenial to their worldview of countries having cultural spheres of influence within which they get to act um, as they perceive to be in their interests. Of course, mm-hmm. the problem with that is what's sauce for, for India also has to be sauce for Russia and China, although, of course, if you're yeah. India, you dispute that. Right. Um, so... So I do think you, and then you know the um, the recent choices uh, about Pakistan also um, sort of that represents a set of of investment and disinvestment, and, and mind you, um, I think perhaps the most sympathetic I'll ever be to the Trump administration is its frustration with Pakistan. Yeah, um, no, I mean it's yes, yes, but it's, uh, yeah. but you look at where money's going and where money's not going, and you know we are we really I it, it is. Um, Again, it's not coherent in a way that you or I like as internationalists, but there are coherent investment no. decisions being made. Okay, I mean, I'm not I, even if let me put it this way: I, I, I do, I like coherency. Period. Um, you know, even if it's a, a you know, a, a populist nationalist uh, argument or sort of a spheres of influence approach. And there are places where I agree with you. You do sort of see that, and I think India would certainly count as one. Um, it's not obvious to me that it plays out well anywhere you know, in other parts of the globe. In some ways, it's 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 a question of uh, it's a question of which regions of the globe do well in that that kind of scenario. And you can argue to some extent the Asian Pacific region is the one that's best suited for that kind of description of how the world should work. Not although that said. It's not obvious to me yet that that you know it, it, a genuine spheres of influence approach 
would be Trump saying, yeah, you know what? South China Sea, that's China's. That's that's fine. That's their neighborhood. You know, we obviously have some strategic concerns, but, uh, you know, so long as we have, you know, freedom of passage and so on and so forth, we're not really going to to weigh in on that. And I'm not sure they've quite taken that step yet. Now, this is the other thing that I think has been very interesting about the first year um, and and very, to me, disheartening as, a, as an observer, is that I think there's a constant negotiation slash um, hand-to-hand combat going on within the administration yeah. between the two worldviews that you just spun out. Yeah. And so pretty much every speech, every statement, um, every budget is a, is a, is a negotiation. And I mean, much more so, I mean, it, you know, there are different foreign policy tendencies within the democratic party as well, as we know, but it's, yeah. I, in my, um, in my policy professional lifetime, have not watched an administration that was this constantly having to having to negotiate with itself, um, which is interesting. And that has, I think, the the advantage that I mean, you know, it's a little bit like Kremlinology. People who are strong partisans of one side can always be pointing to something one side did or a person yeah. who just got promoted and saying, "Oh, see, we're winning. We're doing okay. The adults are in charge." But I mean, another way of of looking at it is that you are sort of racking up a set of compromises that what used to be the internationalist wing of the Republican party is willing to make or a set of, um, a set of things that it's willing to live with. Like, um, you know, one, one might argue that it's really not possible to pursue any kind of, um, 21st century internationalism, um, under the banner of somebody who feels free to call. Oh, now I have to decide whether I'm going to say it's the word or not. Um, uh, um, I mean, like you can't, I'm sorry, but that is disqualifying. You cannot actually be an internationalist who believes in a community of nations working with each other on some basis of equality. If you, I'm sorry, I, I will say the word. I thought you were going to go with community of shitholes, which is a, a fascinating grouping that I would just love to, you know, to write something about Dude, we are we are heading so quickly toward being the leader of that community yes um, well well no this, so this gives rise to a, a, another question which is as you are are uh, no doubt aware um there's been a, a series of public opinion polls uh, global public opinion polls taken over the last uh, year and the numbers are awful for for the united states um whether you look at pew or whether you look at Gallup, uh, the numbers all show the same, which is basically confidence in American leadership um, is now lower than it was uh, in 2008, which is saying something because in 2008, you had George W. Bush as president and the 2008 financial crisis, the epicenter of which was in the United States, uh, beginning to to uh, explode. Um, I, my question to you as a practitioner, because as a, as a sort of international relations scholar, I can make various arguments for why this does matter. It doesn't always matter. I mean, you're being an unpopular president. Sometimes that, you know, it's not like authoritarian leaders necessarily care that much so long as they are going to do business with the U.S. president. But you can argue that democracies do have to pay attention somewhat to what their populations think. And if they're dealing with an interlocutor that is extremely unpopular in their own country, that does you know potentially impose some constraints, um, and then there's this whole soft power concept that that Joe Nye talks about, and I guess my question is, as a practitioner, or as someone who has, certainly has more practice than I do, do you think there is any there there, or has this been sort of exaggerated? You know, I mean, the numbers don't lie, but I guess my question is, do the numbers matter? So point one, um, this administration is choosing to govern in such a way that minimizes the importance of global public opinion. It very explicitly, you know, sort of its um, operating theory of not just how the world does work, but how the world should work, is that it should be able to deal with interlocutors it wants to deal with in any given society. And those interlocutors should be able to control their societies and, you know, have enough support that, that that's all they need. So, um, I will. Although really I want to point, hold on. I do want to point out there that is one way in which there is a sort of logical contradiction at the heart of the Trump administration's view of foreign policy. I, I know, I know, I know you're raising your hands, but it has to be said, which is you can't simultaneously say that we are going to implement a foreign policy that reflects the will of our populist base and then get upset when other countries have to deal with domestic populations that don't like us. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. See, but that just means other countries have failed to grow their own domestic populist base. Ah, uh, there you go. 
So okay. they're 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 what's the what's our word now? Loser countries we're supposed to call them? Loser and hater. It's the losers and haters block. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um so I do think you one has to acknowledge that there have been American presidents um who governed on the theory that global public opinion mattered a great deal and could be marshaled as a force to, to pursue mm-hmm. U.S. aims. Um, and this is a president who, who, who doesn't think that. So, right. you know, again, I, you, I give him I give him points for consistency. Okay. Um, you know, an interesting so an interesting question I have as a as a practitioner is um, does do do implications of this show up first? You know, for example, um, Trump can't really go to the UK. Um, Although I, I think they just announced today you, you uh, for the oh, after the, the meeting after the meeting with May. Yeah, I, I believe they had, uh, right. They announced that there is going to be a visit. Although I don't know if it's going to be a state visit, state. and you know I don't know if it's going to be. Uh, but this way, they were announcing this last year and it got postponed. So yeah. we'll see if this actually happens. But yeah. go ahead. So it's constraining. Um, it's constraining Trump's ability to do person to person. Um, diplomacy, which which ironically is which is, is really important of, to him. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so that is that does conceivably matter. The mm-hmm. other way that's an interesting question is at what point does um, sort of declining declining views of U.S. government start rubbing off on declining views of the U.S. affiliated private sector? Mm-hmm. Um, and something else that you can observe by by watching Davos this evening is that there was no shortage of um, corporate leaders who were very eager to have dinner with Trump in Davos, and not just to have dinner with him, but actually, apparently, they went around the table and all complimented him on his fabulous economic program. Oh my so God! They did was, a replay of a cabinet meeting. Yes, that he wow. flew okay. in Air Force One at taxpayer expense to Davos to have a cabinet meeting. The interesting thing. Is oh, wait, wait, hold on. Was, Sorry. So these were all U.S. multinationals? No, or? no, no, oh, okay, no, no. Okay. Global, right, global right. multinationals. The okay, other right. thing which was fascinating was that although yeah. Davos had been made a big deal about how it was being chaired by three women this year and Davos was supposedly taking on Me Too and all the rest of it, <laughs> uh, want to guess how many women there were at the dinner? I will say zero. Uno. I should have gone with one. It's always one. Um, no, but it was um, um, our DHS secretary. So we had to bring along our own token woman because we couldn't find because we couldn't find a token corporate woman. That doesn't count. Okay, fair enough. Um, but um, but so so the interesting question, you know, the, and those those folks are perfectly happy to make their peace with Trump because Trump is making them lots of money right now. But at what point does the um, does the the soft power problem become a problem for for the U.S. For the U.S. private sector, and and I will I will here I will make another comment that's sort of a little bit of a rant that I have going on right now, that um we, we ironically for for people who tend to see other societies as unitary actors, we Americans I think tend to assume that the world knows us so well that it understands all of our complexities, and it was my observation that there isn't necessarily a lot of appreciation overseas for how closely divided the U.S. is for. Hmm how strong I at least experienced the opposition to Trump to be. So I would think that um, entities that wish to separate themselves from our president may find it difficult to do so in the years ahead. Interesting. Um, I mean, to some extent, I I do have a mild sense of deja vu here because, it's you know, we had a version of this play out in 2003, 2004, you know, during the first year of the or during the first term of the Bush administration when the invasion of Iraq was not terribly popular, you know, in other parts of the globe. There was concern, I remember, about whether or not companies like American Express were going to feel, you know, the pinch or what have you. You know, in the end, it wound up not being all that big of a deal. Um, But on the other hand, you know, in some ways, it's a question of style. Bush was Bush had a certain blunt style, but, you know, he didn't say obviously racist things are actually even subtly racist things, um, by and large, uh, you know, so, and, and, uh, so in that sense, he, it wasn't like he was needlessly trying to offend other people, whereas Trump almost sometimes seems to go out of his way to do that. Well, and we've also played this, I mean, we played this experiment in Europe in the eighties, right? When mm-hmm. there was so right, that's much 
public yeah. anger. So we have we have run the experiment before, but what I think um, sort of gets forgotten is is the change in um, change in relative power over that yeah. period. So you know, in the '80s, you could be incredibly angry at the U.S. and Reagan, and you didn't have anybody else to come and occupy that space for you. And in the 21st century, that isn't true anymore. You have other cell phone providers. Um, you have other internet search engines. So, um, so you know, it'll is, be it'll be interesting. It'll be it's it's something I think to watch again. Not in the next six months, but in the next six years. Right. No. I mean, this goes to two things. First, you know, speaking of of sort of assessments of Trump's first year, I actually think that one of the better things that was written was something that. Um, uh, Jim Goldgeier and Elizabeth Saunders co-authored in Foreign Policy last year, where they essentially talked about the idea of foreign policy and and the international orders. We think about it as sort of a series of hidden investments, that there are times where what you are doing is investing in goods that you can't necessarily see, um, but they're in forms of insurance, you know, which, which, you know, means you occasionally need to cash them in if something bad happens, and you only notice that there's a problem when something bad happens. And so far, Nothing terrible has happened yet. So, you know, we don't see the lack of, uh, of insurance. Um, and that's the, you know, the degree to which you're you're seeing um, the reaction, at, at, you know, at Davos to Trump, for example. I, I, what I'm intrigued by is there are basically two kinds of reactions. As you say, among the corporate sector, so far, they're perfectly happy to deal with Trump, um, you know, because Trump has been good for them. Trump has, if nothing else, done things good for global capital. You know, he's cut taxes. He's uh, fainted in the direction of, of deregulation. Um, you know, he hasn't he has not been uh, loud at all on issues like labor and environmental rights. And a lot of his trade stuff, while bad, has until recently not had an appreciable effect on on trade flows or investment flows. Um, but the second and more interesting reaction, I think, is the the notion that it doesn't matter anymore, because what you're seeing the rest of the world doing is saying, OK, fine, you don't want to, you know, go into TPP or you don't want to, you know, negotiate this treaty deal. We will just work around you. Um, you know, so you're seeing this week, uh, you know, the TPP minus the United States finally uh, being agreed upon. You see Japan and Canada signing free trade agreements with the European Union. Um, you know, you see China moving forward on RCEP. You see Russia moving forward on the Eurasian Union. Now, some of that is Potemkin stuff, but a lot of it is not. And you're now seeing, you know, U.S. manufacturers getting upset because essentially Canadian or Australian manufacturers have access to markets that they don't quite have in the same way. Um, and I, in some ways, that's the more disturbing that globally, that doesn't matter as much. In fact, globally, that's actually mildly reassuring because it suggests um, that even if U.S. hegemony is, you know, permanently uh, on the, the wane, the principles of the liberal international order might actually endure. As an American, it's slightly appalling. Well, and the other thing that I, I actually think about the, the trade measures specifically is is that, you know, the the rhetoric is appalling. The suggestion, I mean, not so much because of any particular deal where you and I have different views, but yeah. the idea that you can walk out of any deal anytime you feel like it, and again, that your word might not be your bond, right? Um, is is a, a huge. That's a huge problem going forward. Um, frankly, the other huge problem going forward is to um, to have told Americans that we can do something different about trade that will solve some of our inequality problems, some mm -hmm. of our manufacturing problems, some of our regional and sectoral problems, all of which are, are very real. And to have actually no, I mean, not just no plan to do right. any of those things, but less than no plan that, you know, basically your only plan is to shovel money in the direction of sectors um, that you like. So you're taking, you know, you've the, there's a swath of the electorate with whom the um, the free and open tools are totally discredited, mm -hmm. and you're now taking. Although the other, I, here, you're, I'm going to hang on, on, hang on. Let me let me All finish, right, and right. then you can push back. So, yeah. but you're now taking the other set of tools, and you're totally discrediting them too. And what we're going to end up with is again not a majority of the citizenry, but a non-trivial amount of the citizenry who sincerely believe that there's nothing anybody can do for them or will do for them. And that's, that is not how you sustain a democracy. 
Well, uh, no. So that's interesting. I mean, a, cu a couple of things on this. The first is, is that you can argue, you know, if you read like, you know, Catherine Kramer's work on, on voters in, in Wisconsin or, you know, Arlie Hochschild uh, uh, on the Gulf area, what's fascinating is that you can argue that, that the sort of voters that tended to, to prefer Trump – we're not. Th uh, you're right. They don't like neoliberalism or whatever, you know, open uh, borders or what have you. But it's also that they're they don't think there's anything better. Um, it's almost like they they simply. It, so it's not obvious to me, actually, that the fact that the Trump administration doesn't actually have a better alternative. And this has driven me crazy for the last year, because in my in the interactions I've had with Trump officials on this, what they've done, a. a Frankly, a mediocre job is saying, well, you know, the liberal international order as we knew it worked for the time that it was created and it doesn't work now. I actually don't believe that. But, you know, that's a that's an argument that you can actually have. But then when you ask them, well, OK, fine, what are you going to do in its stead? They have no answer to this whatsoever. And I find this absolutely appalling, which is to say that, you know, you want to critique, you know, the the sort of system of open borders and 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 freer trade and freer investment. That's fine. You know, there there are grounds to make that that case. But then you have to tell me what's going to be the better outcome, um, what's going to be the better set of a policies, and they've abjectly failed at, uh, at that. And as you say, you know, the one of the more disturbing um, stories that came out this week. I don't know if you saw this because you were in India. Was the Edelman Trust Barometer, which is an annual thing where they poll people about, you know, trust in institutions and so on and so forth. And the U.S. took a massive hit in that area. Um, shockingly, uh, you know, I think it was driven mostly by the trust in government figure. And as I argued in the post, I think part of that is, is that um, the way the question was phrased, it's the one thing that both Democrats and Republicans can agree upon, because if you ask them, what they think of as the government means something different. To Republicans, government means the deep state. You know, it means the bureaucrats. And if you ask Democrats, they think the government now means the Trump administration. So, uh, but as you say, it's no way to run a railroad. It is a, uh, a you know, um, right now I am reading, in fact, just opening up this, and it's scaring the living crap out of me. I'm not going to, you know, yeah. it's extremely well written, um, which as a political fellow political scientist infuriates me that Levitsky and... Uh, um, Zimblack can write that, that. Um, but it's a compelling argument. Yeah. Sorry, that was my rant. No, um, and, and I will I will now follow up your rant with a little advertisement, which is that the um, March-April issue of Democracy, a Journal of Ideas, has a little mini section on the, the future of um, trade policy and international institutions um, oh. curate, curated by yours truly and um, the project that I run at New America. And, you know, one of the arguments that I make in the piece is that we're, we're going to, and um, this is not an original thought to me, I stole it from Danny Roderick, but is is that we're going to have to see um, sort of the fate of American democracy as intimately bound up with our international economic policy. Hmm. Um, and if that is a way that Democrats and internationalist Republicans can see the security and trade link that I think opinion polling shows you that sort of angry voters see in a different way. Um, but you're going to have to start looking at, at international economic policies and say, you know, not just does this produce a net bump for the economy somewhere and not just does this sort of help cement some security relationship that we would like to have, but what does this do to our ability to carry a democracy in which the citizenry believes that that their institutions are there for them? Now, I remember what I wanted to push back on, which is I, the one thing that I would argue a little bit against is this notion that there is this large swath of the public that is genuinely angry about, you know, uh, neoliberalism as we, uh, you know, or, or the sort of open economic order as we understand it, because, you know, again, I'm on the affiliate with the Chicago Council yeah. Uh, yeah. board and the Chicago Council evidence actually suggests that, interestingly enough, Trump being president has caused a massive reaction in the opposite yeah. direction, mm -hmm. which is to say that now it, and this is an interesting what I'm curious about is whether this will be a permanent shift. But essentially, you now have Democrats saying, 
what the hell? I love free trade in a way that they kind of did when Obama was president, because generally that's how this this played out. But even more so now, um, and particularly also on immigration, which is if you take a look at the numbers on immigration, what has genuinely happened is that Republicans haven't changed their minds all that much. But Democrats have gone suddenly much more pro-immigration than they even were before. Um Go ahead. You were going to say something. Well, the, the fascinating thing about those the trade numbers um, yeah. is that Republicans also like trade more, which leads yeah. one to suspect that they like trade because it's their president doing doing the policy, rather than that anybody can figure out what the heck the the policy. It might be. I, I remember. I think this is. There I think are Republicans. so many issues. Sorry, that are trending yeah. that way on yeah. part. I mean, I just I the Russia. I'm sure I've talked about this on Blogging Heads before, but the flip that the yeah. that party partisans did on their views of Russia should be a cautionary tale for all of us. And I just want to, I want to say one other thing, which is, and and because I think this is a very common um, misperception among um, our fellow elites and possibly more so even among democratic party elites, which is to say, yeah, yeah. Trade has majorities on both sides, but the problem is the challenge is that the folks who have decided that trade is the root of their problems are very motivated. Yeah. Um, and we know what the political science literature says about motivated minorities. Um, they also happen to occupy a couple of constituencies that either the parties are going to be fighting over or that one party or the other needs, um, which is to say that there's the sort of white working class chunk of them. And yeah. then there's the chunk of the democratic base, the yeah. activist chunk of the democratic base, which, um, you know, has, has not seen any reason to move. Yeah. You're making that face at me. And I know I, I, this is my, um, sort of Cassandra thing that I've been doing lately that, um, people, I don't know why people think that move on will decide that it likes TPP in 2021 or to put it another way, if you want the next president, I am knocking on my table. If you want the next president and if you want the Democratic Congress to be able to sign the U.S. back up to to TPP minus, right. yeah. you have a lot of work in front of you um, because nobody has done anything to convince the groups that very successfully, by the way, organized and derailed TPP in 2015, 2016, ain't nobody doing nothing to get those folks to change their minds. So I no, no, that, that that's that, that I, I your point is. Let me put this way: I, your point is taken in, in the sense, in the larger sense that one of the problems with looking at the polling numbers on this is the question of whether you know the degree to which partisanship is driving these kinds of shifts, um, and we honestly don't know. All I, all I can tell you is is that I do find it encouraging because you could have argued a year ago that. Trump's election augured the fact that America was shifting radically against the kind of, of liberal international order that you and I grew up on. And although we disagree somewhat on, you know, generally, uh, I would assume, embrace. And that clearly is not the case. Um, it turns out that that Trump produces his own antibodies um, in that respect. Now, the question is, is, you know, is that just opposition to Trump or is it something is it a recognition of the values of these other things that's the part where i think your your point about educating the base or at least conversing with the base seems to matter well and the other point which i think it's very easy for all of us to get distracted from while um sort of living through what we're currently living through is it's all very well to kind of chant liberal international order you know like a mantra but to, to go back to what we were saying five or ten minutes ago the liberal international order that we get back in three years, you know, when you are secretary of the treasury and I am secretary of state is not <laughs> going to be the liberal international order that, that you and I got to play with the last time either yeah. of us was, was, was in government. So hold I on. I, I just want to practice. Wait a minute. A strong dollar is good for America and it's good for the world. Yes. Better than Steve Mnuchin. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, that is the soft bigotry of low expectations right there. Can can we hold up a dollar bill in the background while you do oh, that? <laughs> so, hold on, wait a minute. Yes, let me get the, you know. Uh, we'll go with a 20. What the hell? Do you have a do you have a picture of your lovely wife handy and you could have like a 20 and a picture of your lovely wife? I don't like the message that sends. 
uh, <laughs> for the message that could send. So I do not have a picture my wife would necessarily want to uh, want right. to share with the but entire universe. I guess what I'm saying is that I think we sort of us us internationalists really must start sort of asking yeah. hard questions and not assuming that you know 2014 or 2010 or 2002 vintage institutionalism is going to be the right the right thing either from an international perspective or from a domestic perspective no that i agree with you and it's going to be doubly challenging because as you say what you want to do is suggest you know to what extent can the can the order you know to what extent if there is a restorationist that gets elected in 2020 um you're right that this the 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 heavy intellectual lifting needs to start now um and you know in terms of repairing the damage of whatever is going to be left in the wake of uh, of the next three to seven years, uh, which gives rise to, I suppose, the last question we should ask, which is what are your expectations for uh, for Trump, A, this week at Davos, and B, for the rest of this year with respect to foreign policy? Well, I was fascinated to see um, predictions that the State of the Union would be very heavy, not just on the trade stuff, but on national security as well. Oh, really? Um, okay. And I um, fear that what that means is that um, sort of when in doubt, that's a way to motivate and fire up uh, his base, is to remind his base of all the things that it has been told it needs to be afraid of. Um, and if that's how, uh, we're going to try to get through, um, a, a midterm year, it's going to be a very ugly and unpleasant year. Um, and I think, you know, in a way that might be good in the long term, but is going to be horrible in the short term is going to be the year that we really can't avoid the sort of seeing the inner linkages between, a kind of really nasty ethno-nationalism at home and foreign policy abroad. Hmm. So that's my that's my pessimistic take on on what's coming. Interesting. Okay, my I guess my take is more bifurcated, which is to say that you know it, it, Trump has a message he can sell to some extent at this State of the Union because again, you know if you look at the economy. All of the objective metrics look pretty good, you know. And again, this is uh, except for labor force participation. Can we just? I, nobody should be nobody should be allowed to talk about the unemployment rate in the economy without mentioning labor force participation. But now you can continue. Right. But that said, you know, most of the data, you know, wages are going up. You know, the economy is growing by a decent amount. Again, it's not like there's any radical difference between now and 2016, and anyone tells you differently is lying, um, or actually more likely does not know the numbers. Um, but that said, it is to the Trump administration's credit, or rather Janet Yellen, that the economy has done about as well this, you know, this past year as it did the year before. Um, and that's good because we've had an uninterrupted, you know, string of economic growth since 2000, uh, the 2008 financial crisis. And so suddenly everyone's suddenly feeling pretty good about the economy. Republicans because Trump is president and Democrats because the objective numbers support the idea that the economy is doing pretty well. So I would assume that he's not necessarily going to push for, you know, hardcore protectionism in no small part because everything I've read says that Trump really now feels that the stock market is his principal validator uh, in terms of uh in terms of his economic performance. And one of the interesting lines of argument that Gary Cohn has is, is been making is this will hit hurt the stock market if you start doing this sort of thing, which whatever. But but I assume what he's going to do is talk about the strong economy. And in some ways, the national security stuff will come to him, because the thing that I am genuinely still terrified about is what's going to happen on North Korea um, after the Winter Olympics. I assume that nothing is going to happen until then, until after then, because it seems that Kim Jong-un wants to participate there. Um, but I've seen no indication from the Trump White House that they still think that that Kim Jong Un can be deterred in any way. Indeed, this week, I believe, to be fair to them, that Kim Jong Un actually made a statement talking about Korean reunification, yeah. um, which is, you know, actually consistent with the White House's argument that they think that the nuclear uh, that the North Korea's nuclear arsenal can now be used to somehow lead to coerced reunification. I still think that's wildly exaggerated, but but whatever. I'm genuinely concerned about some sort of conflagration on the Korean Peninsula. Come yeah. March. So, so what will happen in March is that the U.S. Um, and South Korea will resume exercises, mm -hmm. and the South Koreans will feel it necessary to respond to that. 
Um, not you mean the North out. Koreans will, will be? Uh, sorry, uh, sorry I was I was fun. distracted by by the, the barking of the dog. Oh, sorry. Uh, but yeah, so then you'll have another kind of spiral with more testing and more chances, um, more chances for miscommunication um, and sort of unintentional, intentional belligerence. Plus, of course, more chances for incredibly silly tweets. So yeah, I'm worried about that. Um, I'm worried about Iran. Um, mm, I also yeah. think we also need to worry about Turkey. I mean, given that today, um, <laughs> you know, you see, so our allies, the Kurds, are now fighting our allies, the Turks, and our allies, the Kurds, are now going to um, Assad's government for help fighting the Turks, which, Good. you know, if that doesn't leave yeah. you scratching your head, just a reminder that it is only January, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, so. um, which is I, I, I will close with this new theory I have about foreign policy and or the Trump administration, which is what I call the constant crap theory, which is to say that, that if you actually take time to focus individually on certain things, you, you really can be appalled at the various ways that the, the administration has screwed up, whether it's the Jerusalem announcement or handling of the Iran deal um, or, you know, the comments on uh, on immigration or, or what have you. And yet there is such a constant stream of crap coming, you know, across the board that it is almost impossible to focus on any single one thing. Um, and so in some ways, no matter what Trump says at Davos tomorrow, I almost think it doesn't matter because a week from now we'll have completely forgotten it. We'll have like collective amnesia about it. So I'm, I'm sort of turning over a number of metaphors for this, but I guess the the thing that I'll point out is that in the context of us here, none of it matters because it's all the same, going by moment by moment by moment. Yeah. But you know, if you are sitting in Africa, there was a thing that happened that was uniquely problematic yeah. to you, and that led you to start thinking in a different way. If you're sitting in South Korea, there was a thing that happened that was uniquely problematic to you. So, so again, each of these things, which are all just kind of of an of a sameness. To yeah. us here, you know, consuming them like like infotainment, um, but they are all they are each, um, you know, in the sort of Tolstoyan sense, uniquely unhappy for the for the region or issue that's their that's their recipient. So uh, we got to close with the Tolstoy reference. Okay, that's that, that <laughs> we're not we're not going to get classier than that. I mean, come on. <laughs> All right, then the next, you know, the only the only place you go from there is, you know, Russia is the sledge running ahead of the wolves, and then. There you go. Yes. All right. Well, until next time, and, and folks, we promise not to let it be so long. Yes, we apologize for for being derelict. That was uh, a combination of factors at play, uh, uh, mostly my fault. Um, but um, I was I was going to plead never ending stream of crap, actually. But yeah, that's good. actually that's actually a good reason. That's true. Right. But we will we will in twenty eighteen we will overcome the never ending stream of crap. This is a good resolution. I know it's a little. We're, we're still January. We can make these resolutions. Our resolutions are we are going to be better at doing this in twenty eighteen. Yeah. All right. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.